So I'm going to get started. It's a little bit after seven. Uh, and welcome everyone. It's it's nice to see you in this virtual space this evening. I'm Meredith Luke, and I'm the director of the Cantor Art Gallery at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. And I'm delighted to welcome you here today to On Process, um, a panel discussion with artists Ellen Carey and Penelope Umbrico. This event is held in conjunction with the exhibition In Process, Contemporary Photographers Rethinking Their Medium where you will find artworks by both Penelope and Ellen, and which is currently on view at the Cantor Art Gallery through this Sunday, April 10th. So I sincerely hope that you've had a chance to see the exhibition or are making plans uh, to get here in the next couple of days. It's been an extraordinary gift to Holy Cross and to the larger community. All of the artworks um, are from the world-class collection of Mark Nevins, who is class of 1986 Holy Cross alumnus. Um, and the exhibition comprises work from some of the most influential and exciting artists who are working in photography today. These are all artists who intervene within the photographic process um, in diverse ways, um, whose work explores the intersection between craft and technology and creativity and allows us to contemplate the photographic medium in an age of digital photography. We're so thrilled that Penelope Umbrico and Ellen Carey are able to join us this evening. And just a quick note on format. First, Ellen and Penelope will each talk, and then Professor Matthew Gamber will facilitate a conversation with them. Um, the Q&A function is enabled, and I will monitor it. And you should feel free as an audience to type in questions for the panelists at any time. Um, but just be aware that I'll probably give those questions, lob those questions at the panelists um, towards the end of the program and we'll leave time at the end um, for uh, further Q&A. Um, and so you know, feel free to use that Q&A function um, whenever you want and I'll be collecting questions as we go along. Um, so in addition to Penelope and Ellen, I'm joined my, by my collaborators, Matthew Gamber and Randy Rosen on this webinar tonight. Randy is an independent curator and the curator of the Mark Nevins collection. And Matthew is a professor of photography and new medium, new media in the visual arts department here at the College of the Holy Cross. And he is of course a photographer. So I'm going to hand the program over to Matthew Gamber and he will introduce the artists and get things started. Wonderful, thank you, Meredith. Uh, welcome everyone. Very happy to see so many names in the list. Um, we have some really world class artists here speaking tonight, and I'm very pleased that we have the attendance that we do. We we're looking at uh, both of your websites today and talking about your work. So I'm going to give a very brief introduction here. So um, joining us tonight, we have Ellen Carey, who's an educator, independent scholar, guest based artist whose unique experimental work expands several decades. Her pioneering breakthrough in Polaroid sees her pull from 1996, followed by her rollback in 1997, and naming her Polaroid practice Photography Degree Zero from 1996 to 2018. She investigates minimal and abstract images with Polaroid's instant technology, partnered with their innovative concepts, often using only light. Photographies indexical or none in emphasizing zero. Her photogram work is darkroom based and cameraless, and it parallels her Polaroid um, less is more aesthetic under the umbrella concept struck by light from 1992 to 2018. So her work has been in hundreds of group exhibitions in museums, alternative spaces, university and college galleries, nonprofits commercial venues, and highlighted in permanent collections in over 60 photography and art museums, including the Albright Knox Art Gallery, the Mont Carter Museum of American Art, George Eastman House, the Museum of Art, um, the, the Museum of uh, Chicago Art Institute, Fog Museum at uh, Harvard University, and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Um, following, we have Penelope Umbrico, who is going to uh, walk with us through her installations video and digital media works that utilize photo sharing and consumer to consumer websites as an expansive archive to explore production and consume and consumption of images. Uh, her work 
navigates between producer and consumer, both local and global, and the individual and the collective with attention to the technologies that are produced and also produce these forces. Um, Umbrico's work has been exhibited at MoMA PS1 in New York, the Museum of Modern Art, Mass MoCA in North Island, Massachusetts, the San Francisco Museum of Art in California, and, and the Milwaukee Art Museum, and among many others, and is represented in museum collections around the world. She's received a number of awards, including the Guggenheim Fellowship, um, Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship, New York Foundation of the Arts Fellowship, and Anonymous Was a Woman. The monographs have also been published by Aperture New York and RVB Books in Paris. So to start off, um, each of the artists are uh, going to give a, uh, an overview of their work and talk a little bit more about their practice, illuminating um, the pieces that are in the show currently in uh, the gallery space. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ellen. Yes, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for being here. It's spring and hope springs eternal. So um, I'm going to do a PowerPoint uh, on color. And I believe Meredith is going to be sharing the screen with me. Thank you very much, Meredith. Here we are. So uh, again, uh, color is our universe. And color is the artist's universe. If we look at impressionism and et cetera, but photography has its own planet in RGB, red, green, and blue, and yellow, magenta, cyan. And I believe one of the um, often requests on my work is that color has meaning. And of course, I start with my Ellen Carey four C's. The concept is always light. Lights, we can't hold light. It's not we're holding a paintbrush or a, sculpt, a sculpture. Uh, so lights and materiality is a challenge for all of us. Uh, we have inventions, innovations, different techniques and everything. But light, when we look at the history of photography, these are the Talbot and Atkins, Daguerre, the, what I call the powerhouse, the tripod of uh, you know those great minds working with Sir John Herschel um, in England with Talbot and Anna Atkins and Daguerre in Paris. We can see that the light also presents certain characteristics uh, special to our medium. So those are the silhouette, uh, the shadow, which has a lot of philosophical uh, literary um, components, Plato's cave, etc. And then we also have um, the concepts of, of the outline and so forth. And the negative to the positive is also a foundation with Talbot's for example, cascading spruce needles, I'll probably just list all my favorite ones, and the negative to the positive, uh, photogram, uh, contact print, 1940, and then we have Anna Atkins with her size and scale, chaos theory, you know, I've done a lot of uh, research on uh, proportional harmonies found in nature, science and mathematics, and what's so uh, great about Polaroid is that pristine one step peel away process. It's the negative to the positive and that pristine surface uh, echoes the mirror image of Dig Air. So the color is the artist universe. We have our very own planet. Um, next slide please, Meredith. <clears throat> and this is a, a photogram that I did, that I re-photographed at the Polaroid studio in 1995. So it is the physical embodiment of RGB, yellow magenta cyan. And you can see where they overlap. Uh, the red and green make the yellow, <clears throat> the blue and the red make the magenta. And we have the green and the blue making the cyan. And what's so interesting about our, our medium is that the, the uh, colors, when they all overlap and, and sit on top of each other, if you will, make white light, uh, unlike painting, which would turn to black. Um, this image is with several exposures. Uh, it's a black and white photogram that I made, and I did it uh, kind of rotation. So I'm interested in chaos and order, symmetry and asymmetry, uh, this idea of spinning, the rotary references, Duchamp's rotaries. And we can go to the next slide, if please. And the little Polaroid tulips are at the top. So that's a sign signature of Polaroid. The material has uh, meaning in my work. And as you know, all photographers uh, kind of 
investigate materials that have meaning. To the, here we have RGB, yellow, magenta, cyan, and the white is the overlapping, what, which they call the Venn diagram, if you will, where the overlapping is. So we can do on the next slide. Thank you. Um, so, you know, briefly stated, I went to, you know, born in New York, Atlanta, Chicago, went to Kansas City Art Institute for four years. Uh, photography was an empty field. Uh, History of Art by Janssen's was a very thick book. Uh, we have, there are no women artists in there and no photographers. So if we look at uh, Andy Grumberg's new book, How Photography Became Contemporary Art, Penelope's in this book, as many other people are in the, in the exhibition and process. So this gives you an update from probably, you know, the last 50 years. Polaroid obviously was uh, Dr. Edwin Land, who was born in Bridgeport. He came, uh, the one step peel away process was announced right after World War II. And the Polaroid 2024, I'm sure everyone knows this world famous the world over, there are five cameras, and they did the artist support program. In this context, um, the, I was going through artist struggle, and that's a longer story, but trying to empty the frame, you know, what is an abstract photograph? So a lot of my uh, projects begin with questions, and uh, the artist struggle and search is just this. So this is my first Polaroid poll, P-U-L-L, and the left side is a white rectangle. Um, I'm not photographing anything, there's just light. And then the conical loop, the black loop, which is now I think 20 plus years later, is considered a signature of Ellen Carey Pohl. And then the one on the right is no light. So that reference uh, Roland Barth's book, Writing Degree Zero, which highlights the Parisian, the avant-garde, which talk about just Shay S, that the creative act is just, is what it is. There's no narrative art in literature, uh, Albert Camus or Jean-Paul Sartre, there's no beginning, middle, end. And this is, uh, I just tacked them to the wall. Um, next slide, please. And then this is the yellow magenta cyan, which color has meaning <clears throat> for in my work and this reference, the, uh, the photographic color theory, the subtractive colors. So you have, um, as we saw in the previous slide here. And also I'm beginning to experiment with the materials themselves. Um, I did my uh, graduate work up at SUNY Buffalo. I, was, uh, I took museum studies at the Albright Knox. I was a, a curatorial assistant to the great Linda Cathcart. And that was sort of um, a kind of little old mini avant-garde all in itself with Hollis Frampton, Paul Sheritz, the avant-garde and um, structural film, Robert Creeley, the poet, uh, Sidney Sherman and Robert Longo. We all started Hall Walls, SIPA. Um, so, and the, you know, the Albright Knox is a stellar museum. And in fact, it's the first museum to show photography with Alfred Stieglitz uh, 291 uh, when it opened its new wing, which a lot of people don't know. But I started to experiment with the pods. The Polaroid uh, has the envelopes that hold the particular dyes, the chemistry, which the white receiving paper here is not light sensitive, um, but the negatives are. So we go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, these are very large photograms, 40 inches high by 30 inches. It's a triptych, again, exploring color, magenta, the dings and shadows came in about 2010. So I've been printing those. I did um, do a lot of printing just 2020. I didn't do any artwork, obviously, with the pandemic, but 2021 I did, um, and 2022. So I began to, um, in my undergraduate work, of course, we have uh, Joseph Albers uh, color theory and then um, began printing color. I became very, very interested in color, always, always interested in it, in it with, you know, color field painters, etc. cetera. Um, but in 2010, I made a little, what I call the happy art accident. And there was a little ding. Uh, what maybe some people know or don't know is that black and white printing is done in the amber light of the dark room, whereas color printing has to be what's called in a light tight dark room. So you're working in, with, in total darkness. Um, so this is a suite of dings and shadows. And then let's go to the next slide there. And again, here's a diptych um, 
again, celebrating RGB. Usually my palette cues off of photographic color theory. And we can go, the dings are breaking taboos in photography because you're not really supposed to touch the surface of a photographic paper. So I'm going into the dark room and manipulating and actually crushing and folding, et cetera, and then dialing in the colors through the larger, uh, larger heads on the top. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So um, in a precursor to the poll is uh, this series of, uh, in 1995, 96, I had a series of loss in my private life with my family. Um, <clears throat> and my first, uh, I decided to go back to the Polaroid studio in August of, you know, 96, a very, very hot day. And John Ruder and I were working in photography has some, Real, um, obviously, you know, has been around extensively, you know, with Roland Barth and the Pictum and, you know, all those kinds of things. But the family portrait is, I think, something with Polaroid has a real kinship. And this represents my family uh, as it stands in 1996. So the two black were no light, again, using a monochrome palette, using Polaroid materials, but in color. So that was, again, a kind of taboo uh, thing to do. The next tour, my older brother, myself, my middle brother, John, uh, passed away, had an accident um, six months before my mother and the other two, uh, my younger siblings. What was so interesting is the negatives were the same as the positives, no matter uh, whether they were exposed to light or not. And I had studied lithography at Kansas City Art Institute. So this became, I had what Freud called um, the uncanny, the kind of metaphysical nanosack. And, uh, you know, we all realize we're living and dying at the same time, but here's the physical embodiment of that existential state. So, and the, the, the negatives are, are these dark voids, they don't reflect. And then it was the next um, group of pictures that I did the pulse. So it was a really incredible day at the Polaroid studio. I'll go to the next um, slide. And that predates the morning wall, which was um, <clears throat> again, about 45 feet wide, 15 feet high. It's a hundred negatives, Polaroid 2024 negatives, hung in a row from zero to 20, 21 to 40, all the way up. I was raised Catholic, so a lot of the work might have some stained glass references, et cetera, this idea of ascension. And I knew the morning wall was going to change, that the negatives are active, the chemicals are active. Um, I looked at uh, several hundred uh, uh, Talbots at the Smithsonian um, the day before 9-11 actually. So this, this morning wall predates 9-11 by one year and the chemistry uh, oxidized and the silver salts uh, dried up and cured up. And as it, uh, the details in some of this, you can't, can't quite see, but it looked like the morning wall was weeping and it looked like prayer shawls. So it is an organic uh, material. So go ahead, the next slide. And it looked like a whole wall. Um, recent work in 2018, 2019 is kind of crossover between the Polaroid uh, material photography degree zero and struck by light and here I'm, asking myself, you know, what is a 21st century photograph? Uh, what does it look like, you know, uh, in the digital era? And here I took the negative again, taboo crushing the Polaroid negative, which is opaque. So it's not translucent. You can't make another print with it. And then crushing it very, um, you know, free form in total darkness. And then we roll it back into the camera and we pull it out. So this is a crush and pull. Can we go to the next slide? And here you see um, myself pulling the negative away from the positive. And we can go to the next slide. And this is a group of crush and, crush and pulls from 2018. I did 2018, 2019 pausing in 2020 and the Polaroid camera is in my studio now. It, I was used by the late Elsa Dorfman. So I've been working pretty steadily with that for the last year. We go to the next slide. So that's it. So I am working on a parallel project 
called Women in Color, Anna Atkins called Photography and Those Struck by Light. And briefly, I've curated two shows, one in New York City at the Rubber Factory and one in Paris with um, my dealer there, Miranda, and I'm having a show in May, June. And I do research parallel to my own art making practice. And that probably began with writing artist statements, um, explaining minimal and abstraction in photography is a contradiction in terms. Minimalism is a further oxymoron. Um, and people needed to learn what the work was and the empty frame and et cetera, abstraction. Um, so I did research on Man Ray, um, used my research skills from the Albright Knox, and I also was a picture researcher in New York early. And then th discovered the Man Ray uh, just was space writing. So he has his name hidden with a pen light in there. Um, and you hold it up to a mirror. Of course, the mirror is one of the apparatuses in photography and the physical camera and referencing camera obscura. And I also noticed, I you know, love Anna Atkins. I went back and researched all that. I've met Larry Schaff, talked to him. And then I realized there are a lot of women using color photography. And around 10 years ago or 12 years ago, there was a Seattle um, scientist who isolated the DNA on a gene called tetrachromacy. And women who carry this gene can discern color, have four cones, tetra being four and chromacy being color. Uh, better than men, and men have a 20 to 30 percent higher rate of color blindness. So this reframes Linda Nachman's question, the 50th anniversary, where are all the great women artists? So I have to say, we're here, Linda, in color and photography. So thank you very much for having me tonight. Excellent. That was incredible. Thank you for sharing your work and telling us more about your research and your fields. Um, now I'd like to hand it over to Penelope. Okay. Um, oops, wait. <laughs> Share screen. You got, you got my screen here, right? Okay. Um, thanks, Matthew and everybody, and also Ellen, so interesting to hear your process. Um, both of you mentioned the Smithsonian and um, I'm starting with an image um, that, so you can see my screen and you can also see everything, see everything covered, right? With a, I don't know how to fix that. Let's do this, there we are. Um, so I'm gonna start with this project that I did at the Smithsonian um, during my Smithsonian artist residency. And what this is, is it's, um, you can, you all can see this, right? Someone say yes. Yeah, everything, it looks great. Okay, good. <laughs> um, uh, so this was a project that I did at the Smithsonian. It is their collection of, um, in the, in the uh, history of photography museum, their collection of the mini cameras. And um, at the time of uh, the, that these cameras were invented, they were like the, you know, the smallest, most precise and um, incredible technology of the time. They're, they're sort of what the iPhone would be today, I guess. Um, so these are my photographs of them as they're all sort of packaged and put into boxes and put away um, with little tags on them. And I, um, hmm. There we are. I show them like this. Um, and I'm showing these because they, they speak to an idea of, oh, I was gonna start my stopwatch. Oh, they speak to an idea of, um, of technology, but also of access. So these cameras were made to be able to go around and, and shoot wherever you wanted. Um, and it's kind of interesting, I think, how quickly these technology, technologies have changed. So um, at the same time as I was at the, at the Smithsonian, I was also researching images on the National Archives um, website. And I was struck by all these Ansel Adams. These are their, um, my screenshots of their scans of Ansel Adams photographs. And what was really interesting to me was that um, Ansel Adams was, you know, 
um, working for the national services, going out and making these beautiful photographs of the landscape in order to um, let the American people have access to these great landscapes and you know, subsequently make these national parks. And I found it really interesting that well, he's making these photographs with the technologies that are available to him. The archivists at the National, um, in the National Archives are giving us access to his photographs through the technologies that are available to them. So for instance, you see like these, um, the, the, you'll, you'll see all different kinds of scans depending on whether it was a high res scan or a very low res scan or whether it was from a negative, like this one has a scratch on it. Um, and so I was thinking about these things and thinking about how important the mountain is, how stable it is. And um, the, uh, the 60th anniversary of Aperture came up and they asked me along with 10 other artists to um, work with one of their books to do a sort of celebratory uh, project. And there was gonna be an exhibition. So I chose um, the Masters of Photography books because um, I was thinking about atoms and I was also thinking about stability and the idea that, um, well, the master is the most stable photographer. Um, and so I, I looked through them all. There are 20 of them, or at least Aperture had 20 of them on hand. So these were the books. Um, these were all the ones that had mountains in them and they all happened to be men. And, um, and then of those 20, there's only four female artists. So I was thinking about the idea of master and what a master is, um, what stability is in terms of photography. And so I did this little, uh, looked up different de definitions. I just, I think it's important to read this. It's just hilarious. Master, um, a man, who has people working for him, especially servants and slaves or slaves, a man in charge of an organization or group, a male head of household, a person who has dominance or control of something, an owner of a dog, <laughs> um, the title, blah, 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 somebody showing proficiency. Um, well, here they say a man of high rank, um, original movie recording or document from which copies can be made. And then um, mountain, we all know what a mountain is, but I also just like this, achieve impossible results, make every effort, um, range a line of, or a series of mountains or hills, um, the distance between which something can be reached or perceived, the maximum distance to which a gun will shoot or over which a missile will travel, the distance between the camera and the subject to be photographed, and then ranger, a person that ranges the mountains, um, uh, and then a series of nine American moon probes launched between 1961 and 65, the last three of which took many photographs before crashing to the moon. So all of those things were sort of in my head, and um, I decided to use the least masterly uh, camera that I have, and, uh, which is my iPhone and download all the camera apps available for it. So here is a section of some of the selection of some of the apps that I was using. And then I used the filters. So here's a filter list. The weirdest filters like um, this one is like 35 millimeter medium format. Um, there's one Dido Moriama filter, filter di di three or four different Dido Moriama filters. This one, an Obama filter. Uh, just very strange names for filters. This one is has professional in front of every name. And what's interesting to me about these filters is, so I, I use the filters in the camera apps to re-photograph the mountains in these camera, in, in these books. And so this is some images of my camera roll as I was taking, like working through, I made 6,000 photographs in a month. Um, and what I, I was really interested in the filter because they're kind of beautiful and you know I, I think they're really great, but I also just think it's such a interesting sort of paradox because all of these filters are made to replicate the mistakes of analog photography. So all the things that Ansel Adams would never have allowed in the work. Um, so I used all of these photographs. These are the photographs that I took these photographs of, we, um, Aperture borrowed these photographs and some of them were so rare that they couldn't be on loan. So we had to, I put placeholders for them. 
And then this was my installation here. And they made a book. I, I, re, I re, <laughs> remade an Aperture Masters of Photography book in the same form and everything. And then um, it was part of their edition. Here's an example of some of the images. Um, I really love that the camera app and the camera itself with its gravity center sensor would sort of turn the mountain upside down sometimes and you know add these kind of really crazy poppy colors onto them, um, really destabilizing the thing that is the most stable. Um, it's interesting, they kind of, some of them look a little, just a little bit like Ellen's work, <laughs> but they're so different. Um, I also made a book with Aperture um, called Range and, um, it's, it's sort of like a mountainous book. You flip through it and all the pages are different. Um, and it actually opens up and on the inside, you can read a little statement and all the filters are listed there. And this is the installation at the, at the uh, gallery, at the counter gallery. And what this is, is it's every page of this, all the images that I, I, I sort of stitched together for this book laid out and flat. So there are different sizes based on, on how much of the image I used in the book. And then I also show them like this sometimes, like I'll, uh, the thing about the, the camera apps is they make these images and the images can be any size. They can really be printed on any kind of medium because there's no precedent for what they should be um, because they're all digitally, for, they're, you know, they're digital algorithms that are supposed to replicate light, light leaks and bouquet. They're, they have no original size. So um, I've been making these arrays of them, um, like ranges. And then this is another one. I need to take a sip of beer. <laughs> uh, this is another one where um, I lined up the horizon so that it went all the way through the gallery. But actually, it's not the horizon. It's the edge of the page. And then these images are... Um, so look, there's this, these two little pedestals here. One has a, a sculpture of a mountain on it and one has an iPad on it. And they are of this, the Grand Teton and Snake River by Ansel Adams. Um, I had this intern working for me who was so technically proficient that he found, well, I guess this is something that might be easy for most people to do, but it wasn't for me. We found the geolocation of Grand Teton and then made, um, a 3D model of it. We printed the 3D model and then we made a, a digital piece that lives on screen and that was on the iPad. And this is the, um, this is it. You can play with it. If you go to my website, you'll see it. But so this is the, this is Grand Titan part of it. Like the, the mountains that are behind aren't there. So you don't see that bigger one underneath. Um, what I love about this is it sort of rotates on its own and sometimes it disappears. It's completely thin. So it's like so non-substantial, the opposite of a mountain. Um, and the other thing that I think about this is that like if Ansel Adams was telling us in the beginning, um, you know, what nature looked like, we look to him to show us what these places were that we couldn't get to. Um, Google is doing that for us now. And then there's just one more, more piece that I was going to show you, but I guess I lost it. I don't know where it is. Um, I did a set of NFTs of um, using the same strategy, but using a mountain that is in Switzerland called Swiss Fort, Fort Knox. And um, it, 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 um, it's a subterranean data center. So I, I, it, all the data that would hold um, all the information around an NFT would be um, stored there. And so the images are of that mountain. And I'm going to end there. Um, and just to say that uh, that's 10 years of work from 2012 to 2022. So it's kind of interesting that it went from print media to NFTs. You know, so. Great, thank you, Penelope. Really great to see that working process, especially all around that specific project, because all we see is one element that's in the gallery, the printed version. Right. But it's nice to see all of these other elements and thinking that go into that process. I'm not sharing my screen in any, anymore in my notes. Great. 
All right, so I guess now is the time. I would like to ask some questions because right now, um, revolving around the show, I've given a talk and I've come in and um, chatted either with students or other faculty one-on-one. -on -one. And there's a lot of, I think, very interesting questions that have come up around photography. I think the um, for those that use it on a day-to-day -day basis and don't get into the nuts and bolts of uh, how it's made necessarily, um, it's a different strategy of thinking about photography that um, that opens up some doors for conversation. It really challenges this notion of what a photograph is. So a, a couple of questions. I, I want to pose this question for both of you. Um, and I guess what I want to start is, since the topic of this talk is about process, and I was talking with class today about how process is really a series of multiple decisions. And depending on what fork in the road you go down, you continue to follow that path to its conclusion until you can go no further. And then you begin again, and then you begin to make comparisons. So I guess I want to ask about process, how process really uh, it fits into both of your uh, working methods. So um, I guess what I want to start off with is I have a couple of forks <laughs> in the road for this discussion as well. So uh, in when you're both working, there's a, a ton of unexpected results. So Ellen's especially working in the color dark room or working with Polaroids and then Penelope also working with the, the, the filter apps, creating all of these different kinds of distortions that are both appealing and also kind of, you know, disorienting at the same time. So I'm curious, um, how much does failure, this element of risking something not working, figure into your work and results in these concepts? So Ellen, um, I'll ask you to start. Oh, we need you to unmute, sorry. Yes, there we go. Yeah, I have, that's a great question. Um, so I have guidelines to work with. Uh, I begin with concept, light, not light, etc. And that could be any exposure or filtered colors, etc. Uh, and then context, you know, uh, what's in the picture, and that might be referencing to history of abstraction, it could be anything, you know, emptying the frame, um, and then content, context, they can overlap, of course, um, and then citation. So, for example, size and scale. I mean, you know, my influences are obviously, if you look at the website, is Dada, Surrealism, Abstract Expressionism, um, going into minimalism and conceptual art. So, you know, I think it was, um, Robert Smithson, who said size can be a crack in a wall or it could be the Grand Canyon. So I think to consider my failures, you know, as I'm printing in color, um, they really just go right into, you know, I keep a notebook, I keep notes on the larger height, etc. So if they don't work, um, they just go right into the garbage um because i'm doing editing as i'm working there might be sections that have some clues you know the happy art accident i call it um but you know i do have um i have done tests on my i was an athlete as a um, young person young child you know whatever so it seems to me my creative period is you know i start around 11 one and then somewhere around four five six i peak I also do uh, tests, a lot of testing. Um, if I do my ratios one out of five, color paper is very expensive. Time is also something you can't get back. So, but the idea of failure is an interesting question because I'm very interested in the artist struggle. And that's a little area that doesn't get really looked at too clearly. And that became apparent to me with the Man Ray discovery and his space writing. Um, that all these scholars missed. And I realized there's a big gap between the maker of the physical object and the scholars and curators that are looking at it. 
And behind photography, there's all this apparatus that nobody knows about either. So the failure for me is really flipped um, the duality of, you know, let's try this. Now it's not for everybody. You know, the Polaroid camera, the 2024, some people just try for a day and it's, you know, too much, whatever. So, but I, I love it. You know, I love it. I love the challenge. Um, the failures, they just go. And then I keep, you know, the A plus we have being an artist and making art. And then we have the art market and then you have, you know, the art objects. So I had museum training. So it's tier one, you get the best of me, you know, the show, you know, so, um, but I have noticed uh, with students work or people that I work with, uh, the muses will knock on their door and they'll just miss it. So I think you have to be sensitive to your materials. And you have to know, you know, the object speaks back. So you have to kind of be paying attention. It's in a code, it's a visual code, but the dings and shadows, I was printing for, this is an interesting quick story, printing 30 by 40 for three years, 2007 to 2000, and I was getting nowhere. I had my palette, RGB, yellow jet, I was using pen lights. I get feedback from people serious, you know, come in and I'm like, I'm completely lost. You know, I think you have to kind of accept that existential metaphysical, like I'm nowhere, <laughs> you know? And then I went back in the dark room and I was like, yeah, well, I'm like, oh, please, you know, I could do better. And I knew I could do better. I just didn't know where, where I was. And then I took the box, the big box on the paper and I took a little pen light and I went around just the edge. And then there was this little dig there, like, just a little tiny, that three years of printing supported the next 20 years. So it was like training for the, you know, Olympics. So, um, but I had to be able to get through that struggle and accept that they were really nothing. And I think that's okay. So I think there's a lot to be learned in failure if you can just accept the fact that you don't know where you're going, you know? Yeah, yeah the creative process I've found really works like that. You may you feel like you're not making any progress, but you're still putting in the, the work and you're still conscious of where those decisions are taking you. So that is a really great story. Thank you for that. Um, Penelope, um, yeah. any thoughts? Well, yeah, it's, it's interesting because as you were talking, Ellen, I was just thinking, that feeling of being lost feels like failure, but it isn't actually. As you were saying that, I was like, actually, that's what you need. You need that sort of, you know, you, you're so lost and have, have nowhere to go. And then finally something happens. And I also just think it's a really interesting question in relation to your work, your work, Matthew, because one of my favorite pieces of yours is the, um, the Stanford Bunny error. And it's like, you know, well, yeah. And actually, I think the, by way of answering the question, I guess I would say, well, you have to define failure, right? Because if that bunny was supposed to be perfectly defined, then, then the piece is a failure. But if it's about the failure of these kinds of processes, then that piece is perfect and it's not a failure, right? So um, I, and I, I really appreciate that work because I think a lot of my work is about subverting technologies and using them in ways, and Ellen, I think yours also, you know, using them in ways that nobody else uses them. And anybody would consider what I, you know, these things as failures, and I'm sort of massaging them and teasing something out of them, um, as we all are, you know, that that says something it hasn't been said yet because we're working with those things that are sort of peripheral to what's supposed to be happening with those technologies. Right. I think what's interesting in your work, Penelope, is that you're looking for these opacities which make themselves apparent. Every technology, when it's new, appears invisible to the user mm. in the marketplaces, but then it's only after time when we've moved on that we see, oh, well, this camera it makes this weird kind of color shift. Or right, camera. right really reduces things in a strange way. So uh, I want to follow that up with another question just about research and delving into it. Both of you really go in depth with your research in terms of looking at the history or looking at sort of the history of the objects that you're looking at. So Penelope, uh, I'll start with you. Can you talk a little bit about how process really, uh, I'm sorry, how research really works into this idea making 
And maybe what comes first? Is it the idea that comes first that you research or is it the research that brings you to the idea? Um, I don't know which comes first. It's weird because, um, you know, a lot of people think that conceptual work, which I guess I would put myself in that category, although I hate that term, um, you know, you think about the thing and then you go and you make it. And I don't work that way. You know, it's pretty intuitive. You know, I'll be like searching something online. I'll find something. It'll be like, wait, I'll, I'll sort of like, what? And then I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit and that will lead me somewhere else. And then I'll realize, oh, that is about this. And then I'll go to the National Archives and look at Ansel Adams. You know, and I think I was looking there because I was noticing that um, the U-Haul truck had a mountain on it. And um, there was like, I had been to three galleries and all of the work in the galleries were, were mountains. And I, I just was seeing mountains everywhere. All the logos I was looking at had mountains on them. I did a piece about mountain logos, you know, um, because, and I, and I was just fascinated that like, we are sort of in this time of sort of instability that, that our iconography is something that is symbolically quintessentially stable. And, and so, you know, that leads me into research, that kind of thinking, the sort of circles of, yeah. I don't know if that makes, answers your question. <laughs> total sense. I yeah. think finding these concentric circles where things start to meet up, I think your observational powers are incredible because you find these amazing parallels like finding it off the page. I think that's the real cognitive leap. Like mm. it's the work exciting. Mm -hmm. So um, Ellen, do you have any thoughts about how research sort of figures into the work and maybe what comes first, the idea or the research? I think there is a, a twin parallel activity. And for me, you know, again, it's about access. You know, you don't always have access to the color dark or black and white dark or Polaroid and our work is expensive to make relatively speaking but we have all you know when i was i always live around great museums the nelson atkins in kansas city new york you know i said the art students league so i looked at art a lot sculpture painting uh printmaking and i would read about artist lives you know camille and claude camille and his uh his wife claude monet and his wife camille so I'm interested in that area where you are lost, you know, and it reminds me of the Martin Berber, uh, and I can't remember the um, philosopher, uh, you know, the traveler is on a journey that they're unaware of, and it's kind of great, you know, I mean, it's a little scary, you know, I think Joseph Campbell has the cycle of, you know, life, and, you know, it's, it can be daunting, and but I'll tell you, you know, and you have to do what you love. So I love printing. I can be in the dark room 10, 15 hours a day. I mean, and Polaroid is great. And, but, you know, you kind of have to know what you're doing, you know, when you go into the dark room in a kind of, in a sort of umbrella, you know, you have to sort of know and then be available to all that research. Uh, the Man Ray discovery was a fascinating uh, had the wow factor because all these scholars um, never saw it. So I just like was really like, wow. And then I met Henry Adams who did the book on uh, Jackson Pollock and Thomas Hart Benton and who was his teacher at Kansas City. And then I talked to um, uh, the late Francis V. O'Connor who was the Pollock scholar. And I said, you know, I think this man Ray this uh, space writing, which is very small photograph. I mean, when I saw it at the Jewish Museum, I, I had, you know, it was really like two, two by, you know, two by three, maybe contact print. And, you know, I realized for photographers, you know, it's a different struggle with light and the object, um, the breakthrough work. Um, I looked at 400 Talbots at the Smithsonian most of them are faded, most of them are gone, except for his signature on the lower right is perfect. Every single picture had, you know, W-H-F-T. You know, and I thought, wow, you know, here is this 100, 1934, 1940, I looked at Anna Atkins. I mean, they're just incredible inventions and 
to have your mind expand that way. And I think ultimately um, the research supports my, pra my photographic practice really supports it. And I, and you know, sometimes I just don't have access to all this stuff, but I have books I can read and talk to other scholars. Uh, Henry Adams was very generous, Larry Schaff. I mean, when I met Larry, I wanted to meet him, talk to him about Talbot and Anna Atkins. I had a hunch about color and he, he said, well, why, why do you want to meet me, Ellen? I said, well, because you're the Talbot and Anna Atkins scholar. He goes, you're the only contemporary photographer who's ever wanted to meet me. And I thought, wow, you know, here's this huge part of history. And, you know, the Man Ray, Francis V. O'Connor, I said to him, well, I think this is a link between the Paris avant-garde and Pollock. And he said, you're right because he, his friend was uh, uh, Herbert Matter and Herbert Matter and Mercedes Matter were best friends with Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner. So it's kind of wild. And, you know, our, our, we're visual thinkers and we have, we speak visually, you know, when I have something that's RGB or yellow magenta cyan, like the diptych there or the pole with the, at the, uh, which has no color in it. It's really sort of a, what they call flare. So I'm flaring it out to the white light. So, but no, I think it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And I think I, I just love to do that part. Yeah, doing the research, I, I find when doing work, instead of, I think many artists get sometimes um, flustered if they find a precedent that's there uh, before them. and they feel like less inventive somehow. But it sounds like for you, Ellen, that you actually feel more fortified by making these discoveries and finding these precedents. And it allows you to actually find connections that you might not be able to see otherwise. So um, I want to dovetail into another question. And I think it's the sort of you know, the two tone elephant in the room is thinking more about the, the how did um, sort of the state of photography, but I'm more interested in how it's affecting your own practices. Like for Ellen, for you, like the physicality of these materials seems to really make a big impact in how you work with them. Just you're pulling those, um, you know, those Polaroid um, packs and moving through that emulsion and seeing that image of you actually using your own body in that space, the physicality of that seems to make a big difference. And for Penelope, it's the shift back and forth that I think is fascinating. You go from the physical to the digital, yet both of them have this kind of gravity to them. They have this informational weight that you take seriously. So or if you could briefly talk about um, you know, the impact of digital technologies in your work. So um, Penelope, can we start with you? Sure. <laughs> um, it's interesting to talk about the impact of technology on my work in relation to that range project. That range project is, you know, it is related to a lot of the other projects that I've made, but it, you know, I've made, if you do look at my website, you'll see there's multiple projects. Um, and it's the first project that I made where I felt like it didn't have to have any particular kind of um, physical manifestation any particular one, like it could have any <laughs> physical, it could be a video, it could be seen on screen, it could be projected, it could be printed, it could be um, tiny and big and, you know, whatever. Um, and, but it was the, it was the idea, you know, sort of quintessentially the idea that, that natural light has been subsumed to the vacuum of this iPhone, right? Like, that there is no, you know, the idea of a light leak in this or a chemical burn is absurd because there's no space in here at all. And, um, and so the materiality and the physicality of the camera itself that I'm using in relation to the idea of light was really important to me in that work. Yeah, but then other, you know, other projects that, you know, they have to be four inch by six inch snapshots and they have to be printed out and taped to the wall and you have to see them in real life, right? Like not on the screen. So each project seems to call its own uh, material or physical necessity or, or lack of. 
Yeah, that's a really great thought is the reminder that there is this physicality that's in a mobile phone that is a black hole. That right. Is, you see well, it, it doesn't seem to be giving it back in the same way. It's really transforming. And it's, it's interesting because I did that project before, you know, all of this zooming, right? <laughs> but like we have become the light algorithm inside the screen in a way, right? Like we're, this is so flat. And so like, there's no space between us. Yeah, it's just kind of a, and it's that's equally- a, That's a profound thought. Uh, Ellen, can you tell us a little bit more about how digital technology has affected your work? Well, that's a great question. Um, and it has sort of dual, you know, I guess it depends on the project. So the Avon Carter, we did a show together and we did the Polaroid project down there and I met them. They wanted to do a show in 2018 and they had a book initiative and they wanted to do a book with me in addition of 200. And they did one of my uh, zero grams, sort of renaming the photogram, radiogram, and they thought they could, you know, print it digitally and then fold it and have people sort of interact. And I just like, nope, <laughs> you know, I'm going to go ahead and make 200 eight by 10 photograms. And I'm thinking I'm in the dark room and I'm thinking, why did I say that? Like, why, what's wrong with me? I never did the eight by 10 and I had a really, you know, it was a challenge. Truth to materials is important to me. 2005, I did a series of blinks in 1620 photograms, they weren't, I was doing research on the biology of seeing sort of precursor to the women in color. And I blew them up digitally to like, you know, 60 by 80. And it had like, wow, you know, I want visual impact. And those blinks were blinking, they were moving. And then when I started traveling a lot to 2015, you know, before COVID, of course, but I was traveling all the time, you know, it was kind of crazy teaching, traveling, doing shows. I really miss the dark room and I, and I miss the, you know, Polaroid, I miss, you know, then I realized I really missed being creative. So I went back to the self-portrait, which I've done over decades and sort of go in and out of that theme. And I started a series called Hello, Hello Again. And Stephen Jobs, uh, when he invented the iPhone in 2007, did a campaign where people are picking up the phone going, hello, hello. And it does link to Edward Land's Polaroid because Stephen Jobs was a huge fan of Land. In fact, he wanted to buy the big camera at one point. And there's a film where Land pulls out, you know, this object that looks like a cell phone and says, in the future, we will have something in our pocket that we can talk to visually. And I was like, wow, I got the willies on that one. So, and John Ruder has that somewhere, <laughs> but I, and it was so great because I went to visit my aunt who was a nun who was in her eighties and she'd never seen the iPhone. She'd never seen the self portrait. So we used the mirror. So I had the outline of mirror reflection, light. And I was going to Paris and London. I was like all over the place. But I really missed taking pictures because and it, it didn't really end into a project but then it did. Um, and I have part one 25 and I was thinking of the morning while I did a self-portrait with 50 Polaroid negatives and each there's a couple of blanks when my father died and my brother and my mother so this is kind of like hello again you know and so um and I've been doing those so for me digitally is um about access I guess you know the iPhone and we all can always work um, I've been working in 2020, 21, not 2020, 2021, once a month with the Polaroid 2024. And it's, you know, it's quite an endeavor. I mean, there's pre-production, production, post-production. Post there's a lot of, that goes into all of that work. And of course, we all know that. So, and color photograms as well. But it was just sort of great. It was sort of, again, um, about creativity, really, and the creative self, so. And then I met Claire Raymond, who just did a book on self-portraits and the difference between that and the selfie, which is a fascinating book, so. Yeah, using it as a tool to right. enable creativity. I think right. that's a really fascinating thing because working with your materials in the way that you do, there has to be some method of 
uh, working through some thoughts. And sometimes you can only do that visually. And, you know, an iPhone can be a great tool for that. So I think we have some um, participant questions uh, that are in the audience. And Meredith is going to uh, pose the, some of those questions. Hi. Ellen and Penelope, um, and I just want to invite, you know, we'll, we'll take just a you know, couple more minutes um, and invite anyone else who'd like to ask a question using the Q&A function. Um, I have a, a, a good audience question from Nancy Burns, and this is um, to Penelope. She's asking uh, about filters. So she says a filter is used to so separate solids from fluids, but the digital app filters act, add it, act as additives. Right to your re photographs. Um, so thinking about the um, the meditation that you've done on the concept of master, um, wondering about um, what you think about the idea of the filter and what it means to your work, Penelope. That's a really great question, um, especially because uh, I, you know it's it's interesting. I have been thinking about the fact that the filter in as an algorithm is additive, right? It's another sort of inversion about uh, an, an inversion with uh, the material, you know, whatever a filter might be actually. And um, I'm thinking about mostly these days, the screen and how the screen, you know, like a window screen, for instance, will screen out some things and let other things through. And so our, our, um, our, mon our screen monitors do the same thing. And so I've been thinking a lot about like, well, you know, what kind of light we're getting, what, kind, what is being filtered out, what is actually being let through. So a lot of the work that I'm making now is thinking about the screen not as, um, not so much as a filter, but as a sifter. Um, yeah, but I really like that idea. It's a really good question. And yeah, I mean, I think that it's just another example of those those weird camera app algorithms as being the opposite of what they actually really are. I have a question. Um, you know, you both of you, I, you know, are masters, and so I was thinking a little bit about um, what you know. What is the? How do you think about collaboration? I know that you know you, you're thinking about other people's photos that you might be working with, or Ellen, you have met people that you collaborate with in this in the process. Um, where does collaboration play a role for either of you? So Ellen, if you want to talk a little bit about collaboration, that'd be great. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, well, since it was discovered, it's a team culture. We had Sir John Herschel, we had um, William Henry Fox Talbot. Uh, I can't remember Talbot's assistant, but you look at him putting the pictures out in the sun. So they were already collaborating. They were already experimenting, quite frankly, with cascading spruce needles. I mean, you look at that photograph, it's a perfect photograph. You turn it upside down, backwards, flip it. It's like amazing. So they were already experimenters and working with process. It was already team culture. I mean, you might have to make the image by itself um, eventually, like I do in the color darkroom. I mean, when I do color printing, people want to watch me print. And I'll say, well, there's nothing to see. So, you know, it's, it's, I mean, you could hear me in there, but, you know, so um, the collaboration, I think, would be, you know, the gestalt would be between me and the chemistry and just getting everything all it's a skill set that's kind of you know you're looking at 50 years of working here so i think you know i didn't realize it went so fast but um so you know you're collaborating with you know you're in our heaven talking i mean it, you know when kodak went bankrupt that 30 by 40 paper i was in the middle of printing rgb yellow magenta cyan and i had uh, one piece of paper left and I had to do a cyan and my lab was like no Ellen you can do better okay come on you know cut it out so blah blah so I said okay let's order some more paper and they they got on the phone they go oh Ellen there's any more paper I said come on you gotta be kidding me what do you mean there's no more paper there are no more paper in the United States of America the Kodak folded they didn't tell anybody I said there has to be a box somewhere like, I don't care how much it costs, a thousand bucks. I just, you know, buy it. They go, 
nope, they did everything. So I'm in the dark room and I'm like, thinking, oh boy, this is great. I can't finish my series, RGB, Yellow Majestic. So I said, okay, Talbot, Man Ray, and Atkins, I really need some help here, really, people. This is the last piece of paper on the United States of America. And I need some serious help here. And I got it. So, but I don't, you know, the serendipity, I think, uh, chance randomness and chance you know you play you know you you need to make a great photograph the the day you know it's about excellence you know it's really about excellence when i look at great photographs i'm like you know there's the artist struggle edward curtis lee miller and man ray didn't have any heat you know that's it's a it's a lot um but the collaboration, I think, is a constellation of an internal, intrapsychic, metaphysical, spiritual, whatever you want to call it, and the external. So, and I think um, uh, Mark Nevins just uh, found the quote for me from Martin Berber. So I think that's available to look for everybody. Yeah. Um, um, Penelope, did, so I, I love the idea of collaborating with the sort of with ghosts, uh, you know, like with, with with karma. I mean, these sort of big, these big entities that are playing a role in in affecting your work. Um, yeah, it's a really, it's really good, actually. <laughs> I would say that I collaborate with everybody who ever posts anything online because not only am I using their work. I mean, I I feel like I'm not using the work. It's not work that I'm using. It's just an image that is. Um, I, well, the the mountain project, the range project, is a little different because it was some, it was other photographers' works, and I think in that work, I'm equally collaborating with those photographers on a certain level, and maybe more in this the level that Ellen's talking about because they don't know that they're collaborating with me, and that would then technically not be a collaboration, um, but with also just all the you know, software engineers and anybody who uses Photoshop is collaborating with every software engineer that writes, you know, like millions of collaborators that that have created that software. Um, but I have done a number of projects where I've made a call for images and then worked with those images. And then that, that really is a collaboration, except for I'm very much like Ellen in the same way in that I like to work on my own. I, I really, I, it's just really difficult for me to work with other people. And so I call for the images and I tell them what the, the parameters are and what I, you know, what, what they can expect I might do with them. And if they're fine with it, then I, you know, I get to use those images. Um, but then I'm working on my own. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I've ever done anything where I've actually made a body of work with another person, which would technically be a collaboration. It's an it's an interesting question, and the fact that you're you know you're both kind of reaching out. Um, it, it's a, it brought up a question from the students, and I think I think we'll end here because it really is sort of past time, and um, and we want to to honor your hour hours worth of work here. But um, one of the students posed a question um, here at Holy Cross. We have this um, sort of big theme for the year, um, and that's kind of attending to some of our courses, that um, especially in the in in some of the creative work um, that is um, looking backward and moving forward. And so the question that the student asked was, you know, is there any way that you see your work related to this theme of, sort of looking backward and then moving forward? Um, I'll just say that I, I think it's really important to know the historical context of where you're coming from, but in terms of studio practice, it's really good to not look back. You know, it's like really good to put the stuff that you've done away and not look at it because it tends to pull you back and, and, and it really helps you move forward to not be looking backwards. So there's two ways of thinking about that, I think, and yeah. You know. Ellen? That's a great question. I, I think your archive is your archive and whatever you need to do to support your struggles or your, there's also a great history of photography and also painting. I'm thinking of the Cayu Bay that the Getty just bought where the 
you're in Paris looking out the street. There, are, there's a whole genre of, of people being photographed from the back, or painters using the back as a symbol of. Um, and someone's going to have to help me here, Meredith, with art history, the painting, um, and you know the back. You look at Man Ray's back, looking forward, looking back. I think I think about my work in terms of time. You know, time is finite. Photography deals with time, shutter speeds. It's something you can't get back. So I think whatever, whatever you need. I mean, I'm looking through when we went to uh, COVID, we pivoted at, uh, I started looking at my archive. I, I had no, I was looking at negatives from graduate work and, you know, it's a bittersweet experience because, you know, that was 50 years ago and 40 years ago. And I didn't realize how, of course, we know time goes fast, right? But I didn't really realize that it is so finite. So I think just use your time wisely and, uh, you know, maybe use it as a reference. It's your own history. Um, you know, I don't always look at my work back forward, I, you know, but I've reversed images. I flip them upside down, you know, sometimes on the computer, I'll rotate them. Compositions really, I, you know, for me, visual impact is, is the end game. You know that 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 has to, the work has to have visual impact, and however I get there to the image is 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 my my struggle, my artist's life. So that's our my job. Whatever I hate to call it a job, it's not really a job. It's uh, it's like tons of fun. You know, it's, it's fantastic. But you know, I've had some tough times as well. So. Then I just go read about Edward Curtis or, you know, Lee Miller or Man Ray. And, you know, it's like, okay, like not that bad, you know, but when Polaroid closed, it was, it gave me the opportunity to go back into the dark room, look at photograms. You know, what am I going to do now? Drama, drama in 1988, you know, I had not a clue what I was doing. I was complete. Okay. That's it. I'll go play chess, like, you know, Duchamp and, that's it. So I had to accept the fact that there's finite materials, as as we know. Um, but I don't want to give up my materials. So you know, it just to me, what's the point? You know, it's like Brancusi took this. You know, the great Brancusi took uh, the sculpture of the pedestal off. You look at the Greeks and the Romans and the sculptures on the pedestal. Then he took it off, and then. Donald Judd, I went to Marfa, I looked at Judd, you know, he took it, he had these incredible colors and plexiglass and aluminum and brush, and those were his materials. So I think it's important. No, I'm not digitally native. Um, I do find it intriguing. Um, I'm not sure if I have found my way with it quite yet, like Penelope has and other my peer group, but, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm finding my way. But. Well, I meant not me finding my kind of way with digital. Are you people, you know, <laughs> people make fun of me. You don't have any digital work yet? I'm like, no. You know, but um, whatever. I mean, I think you just have to be open to, if, if you do experimental photography, you have to be open to all kinds of things. Failures, pluses, minus, film going bad, you know, the happy hour accidents or whatever, so. Anyway, that's that's what I think. But. Thank you so much, Matt, Matthew. Do you want a final? Do you want a final word as well? All of these, all of these words from our two artists are more than sufficient and give us a lot to think about. I think that was really great. Thank you both for participating. Yeah, thank you for a, a really great program tonight, and um, thanks for the great questions that came in from the audience. Um, those of you out there who haven't seen the exhibition, you have until April 10th, and um, you can come see these works in person, um, which is, I think, really the only best, the best way to see them. It is the only way to experience the work. If you look online, it is just a tasting room. You must go and see the work in person. Great. Thanks so much for inviting us. It was really fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.
to stay on, Meredith, or? You're going to kick us all off. <laughs> that uh, I really have cool. a question, <laughs> if there's still time. With, can we just talk to one another now? Yeah, sure. Sure, the participants are, are down to 15, so people are leaving. Um, okay, I, I just have a question for Penelope and for um, uh, Ellen. Given that so much of what we know and how we're learning and what we're experiencing is now coming through digital imagery, that it's becoming the central way in which we get knowledge of ourselves, our world, et cetera, what effect do you guys feel it's going to have on memory. In other words, all the images that are in the camera, of, you know, a, what used to be in an album and you could look through again, again during the year or in generations, the events of life, uh, the, the wars in the, in the world are all going to be sucked up into this digital for, uh, format that people may never access again they, because it's out there saved. But it's not tangible in the way an analog photograph used to be. Mm. What is this doing to memory, family histories, cultural histories, uh, our own sense of, you know, everything goes like this in imagery, every, even the news, it's, it's gone in a minute. So what is that doing to our memory, culturally mm. and personally? You know, it's interesting. I think Apple is trying to deal with that where, you know, you open your phone and it gives you like, this is the photograph you took six years ago or like right. a year ago, this was happening. Uh, it gives you little um, snippets. Right. It's shocking. Huh? It's shocking. I know. <laughs> um, but, you know, how do you learn culturally if yeah. culture disappears? It's interesting. I had this experience um, about 10 years ago. All of my students, all my undergrad students were bringing in, they were knitting and they were buying vinyl records. And did we talk about this? I can't remember if we had a conversation about this. Yeah. before. They were, they were doing all these really tactile things. And I realized it was the generation where they had started off as having had photographs taken by their parents that were that were printed and put up on the wall or in albums or whatever. And then by the time they hit 12, their parents were getting digital cameras and those digital files were so bad that nobody did anything with them, but there were no physical prints either, right? So they, this, I think this generation had this sense of complete physical disappearance actually. And they were compensating for it by making all of these material, like they all wanted to do, you know, alternative processes and, you know, they weren't interested in anything digital. And now, um, you know, now the digital native, whatever, maybe that's not the case because I never had that expectation. But I think you're, Randy, what you're talking about is from the point of view of someone who always had that expectation. And, but photography is only like 200 years old, right? So before that, we didn't have pictures. We had paintings. Yeah. But only so some I, people had paintings. I think yeah, it's living like, in the present and the now, which doesn't have a perspective. Mm. It, well, anyway, I, I just think memory is being affected. Not only do they find that some of this is affecting the ability to have a good memory. Yeah. But what happens as time goes on where there's no historical record that anyone regularly absorbs and moves on from? It may be positive, it may be a positive. Or, or actually the alternative, the, the sort of difference, the, the, the converse of that is there's so much historical record, right? Like there's so many narratives and there aren't any, any, um, any prominent ones. So there is no actual history because yeah, like Trump that's is a whole other issue. Right right as, huh? That's a whole other issue right now that there's no common center anymore. Well, and in fact, we could say the same about images. There's just so many of them that not one of them means anything. Well, anyway, I just thought it was an interesting part of these. Yeah. Anyway, Again, I'm not it is a good Thank you very much. Oh, well, <laughs> Randy and I, Wonderful. we can talk about it later. I mean, it's a good question. Well, um, memories so kind of dominated that answer. <laughs> memories. I mean, John Ruder could tell you I have a great memory. He doesn't. So I, I, you know, it has a different context. 
this is Gen Z um, that I'm teaching now. And uh, again, you know, I think there's a, a parallel universe out there where they want to learn about web processes, color, they want to have meaning in their life mm -hmm. because they got those flip phones at t seven, 10, you know, uh, their childhoods were different from post-World War II. So I, I think, um, you know, and then I could meet somebody at APAD, a young photographer from England. I'm like, oh, you're so lucky you're from England, you know, the home of Tal, you know, why am I lucky? Talbot, and I could, never heard of them. So I think it's, it's almost like you know, the tree of knowledge. Like you can pick and choose whatever you would like to learn about. But there is the larger cultural, I am worried about a kind of erasure. Exactly. Um, Good word. Yeah. So it's like George and Orwellian. And it's meaning. Orwellian. Yeah. It's a little, it's scary. Yeah. It is scary. Anyway, thank you, Penelope. Yep. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Matt. It was wonderful. Yeah, it was really fun. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Alice, I'm going <laughs> to, I will see you all soon, I hope. Okay. <laughs>